Hi, welcome back to Physics Teacher. This was a question on the Sir Isaac Newton contest, which is the high school physics contest from Waterloo University. And what we have here is a crate that sits in the middle of an airplane as the airplane tilts in order to turn in a uniform horizontal circle with a speed of 150 meters per second and radius 500 meters. What will be the minimum coefficient of static friction required to prevent this crate from sliding. Give it a try and I'll be right back with the solution. All right, so what we're going to do first is we're going to have to figure out how much this plane tilts in order to maintain this radius at that speed. So we're going to draw a free body diagram, and this is going to be for the plane. All right, so the plane undergoes gravity, of course. So I'm going to call that mg. I'm going to put a big M because that's the mass of the plane there. And then it undergoes a lift force. That lift force is going to be perpendicular here. And so on this diagram, I'll draw it sort of at an angle like that. And that angle, if we split it up into components, this angle right here will be theta, will be the same angle that the plane is lifted at. And you can imagine that if the plane wasn't lifted and that theta went to zero, this theta would also go to zero and that lift force would be straight up. But what we have now is this component of the lift force, which is directed um, towards the center of this circle, so it's going to contribute to centripetal force. Okay, so now before we analyze this, let's make sure we choose a coordinate system. So let's make this our positive y direction, and I'm going to make this our positive x direction, because according to this diagram, that will be the direction of acceleration, or specifically centripetal acceleration. Okay, now Newton's second law. Let's start with our vertical component. So the sum of all forces in our vertical component will equal the mass of the plane times vertical acceleration. But since this is in a uniform horizontal circle, there is no vertical acceleration. So that is going to be zero. And how many forces do we have acting vertically? Well, we have gravity acting down, so that's going to be negative. And we have some component of the lift force. If this is the lift force, I'll write it as F subscript L. This will be FL cos theta. So what we have here is FL cos theta minus gravity equals zero. And let's write that as equation one. We'll come back to it. Now let's look at all the forces that contribute to centripetal force. Centripetal force is horizontal to the left. It's always center seeking. And it looks like we only have the one force, this component up here. And that is going to be FL sine theta. So FL sine theta. And that equals to the mass of the plane times centripetal acceleration where centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. And let's call this equation 2. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I need to solve these two sets of equation for theta. Okay, because I have two equations with two unknowns. I don't know um, what theta is, and I don't know what the mass of the plane is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take equation 2, and I'm going to divide it by equation 1. So what that, what that is going to look like will be looking like something like this. So equation 2 is FL sine theta equals mv squared over r. And if I divide that by equation 1, let's bring the gravity term to the other side of the equation when we do that. So we will have FL cos theta equals mass times gravity. Now this is great because these mass terms now cancel. Not only that, but I don't know the lift force either. So those are going to cancel as well. And if you remember your trig identity is sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. 
and we're left with v squared over gr, all of which I know. V is 150 meters per second, R is 500 meters, and we're going to take G to be 9.81 meters per second squared. So when I do that, we can find what the angle theta is. So again, V is 150 meters per second squared over 9.81 times by 500 meters, take the inverse tan of both sides, and we get theta equal to 77.7 .7 degrees. So we know what theta is, and that's pretty steep. All right, so now that we know the angle that this plane is making, and therefore the angle or the incline that this crate is sitting on, let's look at the free body diagram for the crate. So I'm going to create a, a new page here. And if I were to draw this crate, on an angle, we'll draw that here. So here's our angle theta, which we already calculated to be 77.7. .7. We have our crate here of some mass m, and let's draw the forces acting on it. We have gravity acting downwards as little mg, because this is for the crate now. We have a normal force acting perpendicular to the surface, so that's right here, fn. And we have static friction. Now remember, there's an acceleration, a centripetal acceleration in this direction. And so we have static friction trying to oppose that in this direction parallel to the incline that it is on. So there's a static friction. All right, we'll use the same coordinate system as before, where this is going to be positive x, and this will be positive y. And therefore, any vectors which are not parallel to x or y we're going to need components for and that means we need components for the normal force which is going to look like this where this angle here is going to be theta and we're going to need components for static friction like this where this angle here is theta. All right, so let's start with uh, centripetal forces. So if we take all the forces which contribute the centripetal force, that is going to equal mass times centripetal acceleration, again, now for the crate. All right, so what um, forces are actually contributing to centripetal force? Remember, centripetal force is in our x component. So we have this part of friction, which will be negative, it's in the opposite direction, and that part of the normal force. So this component of the normal force would be Fn sine theta minus this component of static friction, which will be Fs cos theta. And that is going to equal mass times centripetal acceleration, where centripetal acceleration is V squared over all right, and we know the equation for static friction. Just a reminder, static friction equals the coefficient of static friction times our normal force. So I'm going to replace that with um, this equation here. So we have still have Fn sine theta minus static friction becomes coefficient of static friction, which is what we're looking for, times the normal force, cos theta, equals mv squared over r. All right, not much we can do anymore with that equation. There's too many unknowns, so let's call that equation 3. Now I'm going to go ahead and look at all of our vertical components. So let's do this down here. The sum of all forces in y equals mass times the acceleration in y. Now again, it's not accelerating up or down, so that is going to be 0. All right, but what forces do we have? Well, we have both normal and static friction, or a component of them, which are up. So they're both going to be positive. So this normal is going to be Fn cos theta plus. Then we have this component of static friction. So that's going to be Fs. But I'm, instead of Ss, I'm going to write mu Fn. So I'll just replace it with mu S Fn 
times the sine of theta for that component. And that is going to be minus mg, which equals zero. But I'm just going to bring that negative mg to the other side of the equation and make it positive. So this is what we're left with. Now let's call this one equation four. So once again, how I'm going to solve this equation for theta is I'm going to take equation three and divide by equation four. Uh, but I'm going to need some room to do that. All right, so equation three, we had fn sine theta minus mu s fn cos theta equals mv squared over r. And then we're going to divide that by equation four. So on the left side, we have fn cos theta plus mu s fn sine theta. All divided on the right side, we just had mg. All right, so this is the equation we're going to solve to figure out what mu actually is. So first of all, we can factor out an fn from both terms in the left side of our equation. So all the fn's can actually cancel. And we can also cancel a mass from the right side of the equation. So what we're left with now is sine theta minus mu s cos theta all divided by cos theta plus mu s sine theta equals v squared over rg. So now I'm going to multiply both sides by this ugly denominator. <laughs> so we're going to get sine theta minus mu s cos theta. And that's going to equal, here we have our v squared over rg multiplied by cos theta plus mu s sine theta. Next, we're going to take this term here and distribute it into this bracket. And then we're going to collect like terms. Notice that we'll have one term here on the right side with mu s and one term here on the left side with mu s. So let me take all of my terms with mu s and put them on the left side of the equation, and everything else on the right side of the equation. So when I do that, I will get mu s cos theta plus v squared over rg times mu s sine theta. And that's going to equal sine theta minus v squared over rg times cos theta. So now you can see I can factor out a mu s and then divide both sides by what I factor out and we're, we'll have solved for mu s. It's not very pretty, but um, that's what this question is. So when I do that, I get mu s equals sine theta minus b squared over rg times cos theta all divided by cos theta plus v squared over rg sine theta. And we know what v is. It's right here. That's v. We know what r is. That's r. We know what g is. g is 9.81 meters per second squared. And we know what theta is. That was 77.7 degrees. And so when we plug everything in to solve for mu s, we get a number that is extremely, extremely small and therefore close to zero. So the answer is A.